Okay. When the enemy gets in close, by close I mean 250 yards away. Now, let me back up just a minute. The problem with a gun having three miles of range, how many of us can see three miles? None of us in a normal situation. That's why on a battlefield, you're generally going to find the artillery located on the high ground. Highest ground here at Kennesaw Mountain is top of Kennesaw Mountain. But interestingly, the Confederates had put Napoleons like this gun here because their target was the railroad, which is right through this line of woods over here. And if we keep giving this talk, a train will come by, let me assure you of that. Well, what happens here is the uh, federal forces, our forces, run an engine and a train into the wooden water station to draw fire. Captain Lumpson's battery opens up. Captain Lumpson said, we hit the water tanks and we scattered water and yanks about indiscriminately. Unbeknownst to him, sitting outside his range was a battery of federal rifle cannon. And they began, of course, you saw how much smoke with one gun. Think four guns like this, full charges up there. If you're advertising the world, here I am, shoot at me. And that's what they do, what we do. Uh, the counter battery fire, Lumsden, one of his officers, that's the commander up here, said the federal fire was so accurate that they were exploding their shell about three feet above our works. Now, for some of you who live here locally, the federal battery that was firing at them was sitting over at the intersection old and new 41 and behind what now Cowboys Country Western Red uh, Emporium, whatever you call it. Hooters restaurant over there, whatever. That's two miles. Exploding four feet above the Rebel Works in his own. So quite the this is as good as it got as far as muzzle loading artillery. Now in order to have accurate and correct and sustained fire you got to have a well-trained gun crew. Artillery is a crew-served weapon. And this is a military organization, so you've got to have somebody in charge. I already talked about ultimate charge, but in charge of the gun itself and its firing is a person, he's an enlisted man, called the gunner. He has on him a small removable sight that sits on brackets at the uh, rear of the, the breech has a sliding scale on it, and that's what he's using to sight in on his target. Under him are a number of enlisted men, privates, who have numbered positions. Now, we were cross-trained. We were trained to do every position because you're going to take casualties. And you're going to have to cover. Somebody assume the duties of someone else and the whole school of what, the, of what you do. At the right front is number one. He has in his hand what's called a sponge rammer. It's a stick, stave. On one end is a wooden mallet covered with sheepskin. That's called the sponge. He will dampen that. It is inserted into the barrel following a firing to kill any sparks that are left over from the previous firing. On the other hand, end is a mallet called the rammer. Sponge rammer. The mallet is used to ram first the powder charge and then the projectile down the barrel. Opposite him on the left side is number two. Number two's duty on the command of load, he steps in and waits to receive the ammunition which he places in the barrel for number one to ram. First the powder charge, secondly the projectile. At the right rear is a cannoneer who has a myriad of duties. On the command load, he steps in, takes his left thumb, and covers the vent, the opening in the barrel. He is sealing that vent so that while you're loading, just in case you haven't killed all the sparks with the sponging operation, you're not going to create an airflow which will fan those sparks up. It's going to create, in essence, a vacuum in there. Once number one and number two are through with their duties and step outside the wheel, number three will go to the trail hand spike. That's that baseball book, that looking affair at the end of the trail and pick it up. And on command from the gunner, he will shift the trail right or left. That's assisting the gunner in the actual aiming of the piece. Gunner's got two adjustments. 
shift the trail right and left, he's got an elevating screw that raises and lowers the barrel. And that's the way he's making his sight. Once the gunner is, is, is sighted in, he throws his hands up, kind of a touchdown figure, and number three goes back to the original position. The gunner gives the command, ready? He steps inside the wheel, he takes a long pointed wire called the vent pick, inserts it in the vent and punches a hole in the powder bag that's been previously put in that. This will expose the powder for the next step. The gun is actually fired by number four, who's on the opposite side. Number four does this using a device that had been developed in the 1850s, once again that industrialization is going on, called a uh, friction primer. That's the ignition system right here. You get an idea of the size of it. Basically a brass tube. Now you can't see this, so we've got a visual aid here. All good this is what you've just seen greatly enlarged. The way this works, this longer tube drops down into the vent. It is filled with very finely granulated gunpowder. A little dab of beeswax here in the bottom to keep it from falling out. Up here is kind of a chemical paste, much like the head of a match. Through that is a serrated wire with a loop on it. Place that in the vent, hook your lanyard, which is a rope with a hook, into the loop, play it out, and on the command fire, you pull the lanyard, which drags the wire, serrated wire, through the match material, which lights all of this, which fires the flame down into the powder charge, and sets the cannon off. This is blown out and a brand new one every time you fire. This is weatherproof shooting any kind of weather. Previously you used a thing called a lens stock or a port fire. By the way, they didn't use torches. Hollywood is finally coming around to accepting that, but they had figured out in the early days of the use of gunpowder that torches and gunpowder are not a good combination. So they for years used a device called a, a quill primer. It's basically a goose quill filled with gunpowder. That was the ignition. This is much better.